Hi everyone and welcome to episode number 15 of The Display Show. I'm Brian Berkeley, here to discuss new developments from the electronic display world. Today's guest is Chirag Shaw of Samsung Display Company. Chirag is speaking to us from South Korea, where he leads the go-to-market team for Samsung's QD Display. He is a graduate of Northwestern Kellogg School of Management and he has an electrical engineering degree from Georgia Tech. Chirag is passionate about bringing new technology to market. He lives in Seoul with his wife and two boys. When not tinkering with technology, he loves to recreate ancient tandoori recipes in the kitchen. Today, we're going to be talking about Samsung Display's new QD Display, which was introduced at CES in January. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell for notification when new episodes are released. Now, on with the show. Chirag, thanks for joining us today and welcome to The Display Show. Well, thank you, Brian. Thank you for having me here. I'm excited to share QD Display with your audience. I'm a big fan of The Display Show. Uh, I love all the episodes you guys have put together. Uh, I really enjoy, you know, you bring a lot of deep experience from your own past uh, with the display industry. Great set of guests. It's always so much educational and informational. I really enjoy it. So really excited to be part of this. Well, it's great to have you here. Um, I mentioned in the intro segment that Samsung's QD display, uh, which is sometimes called QD OLED, was introduced in private showings at CES in January. In, in a few moments, Chirag is going to give us an introduction to this new display technology. But first, I'd like to give some background to explain why we wanted to make this episode about QD OLED. Before CES, in December 2021, a few specially selected folks were given a preview showing of the QD display here in Silicon Valley, California. Our producer, who is Jeff Urich, and I were among the fortunate ones to get an early firsthand look at the technology, which included both TV and monitor demonstrations. Now, this was no casual demo. We were able to conduct side-by-side -side comparisons of the QD display next to white OLED and quantum dot-based LCD displays. We were able to take measurements on all of the displays using photometric equipment, including measurements of specific test patterns that I had requested without any advance notice. You can see in the images here, that's me wearing the mask, holding the photometer probe, collecting data using any test pattern that I requested. I was able to compare the data from the conventional displays to confirm that they were functioning normally as the data matched known performance specs. We were able to take as much time as we needed to make visual observations and to take measurements. We viewed the displays at on and off axis perspectives, and additionally, we made observations not only in darkroom lighting, but also with higher ambient illumination, in fact, over 300 lux. Let me just say in summary, I am very excited about this new display technology, and I'll explain in more detail later. With that brief intro, Chirag, I'd like to invite you to present an introduction to the QD display. You presented this technology at CES, and you're going to give us an overview to explain its construction and benefits. Chirag, please take it away. Well, thank you, Brian. Yeah, you know, meeting um, not only you, Jeff, etc., uh, and the others at San Jose was fantastic. I really enjoyed, you know, interacting with all the display and color experts and, you know, having a very honest and very, you know, exciting chat about what QD Display has to offer. So yeah, that was a great, great event. And thank you for, in spite of the COVID challenges, you know, being part of it. Um, you know, as today, you know, as much of our lives are being taken over by the screens uh, we look into, uh, I think we are really thrilled and excited to bring the next evolution of display technology to the world. I think, um, you know, consumers who want to experience magical home cinema or really immersive gameplay, they will have a lot to celebrate and appreciate uh, with what QD Display has to offer. So let me kind of bring up my slides so that we can dive into uh, some of the details here. So let me first, you know, kind of break up from you know, what makes up the QD display. I think that's the foundation of what differentiates it as a technology. So QD display brings together the best of material science, quantum physics, and vision engineering to really build a new layer and a new evolution of what display capabilities uh, we can bring 
to consumers. And the core of it is a very advanced yet elegant three-layer structure, uh, starting with the blue self-emitting layer. So our foundational layer is an oxide backplane. And then this is the world's first blue self-emitting layer. So we're using a blue OLED uh, to kind of found the uh, backlight of the display, but these are self-emitting blue OLEDs. Uh, the second layer is uh, the printed quantum dots. So previously quantum dot displays had quantum dot sheets, but this is red and green quantum dots printed on each subpixel to kind of bring a true RGB uh, OLED technology to the market. And what this allows is to create color using color conversion uh, so we have the blue light that is then activating the red and green quantum dots and the blue pixel itself is a clear uh, pixel with some scattering material to uh, kind of match the performance, uh, the scattering performance of quantum dots to create R, G and B uh, colors. And that's, you know, different from all the traditional technologies that depend on color filtering in order to create those colors. Chirag, I'd like to stop you here since there's a lot to unpack in this slide. I think the first question many of our viewers will have is, why blue OLED? Yeah, that, that's a great question. So blue OLED is the higher frequency wavelength. So what that allows us to do is, because it has a higher energy level, uh, we can then down convert it using red and green quantum dots to create very precise red and green color. So the process is called photoluminescence, and that, uh, you know, using the higher energy blue light, we can then activate uh, the red and green quantum dots to create the red and uh, green color. And that's the reason why we use the higher energy blue backlight. Okay, um, but blue OLEDs are known to have relatively short lifetime. Can you comment on expected display lifetime and image retention? Sure, sure. So I think that's, that's you know, a foundational question for any OLED technology. Uh, so I understand where that's coming from. Uh, in terms of our technology, what differentiates it is number one, a lot of research and development has gone into kind of creating the right blue OLED or the right blue uh, self-emitting layer, uh, which means that we have, you know, you know, the research and development teams have invested, uh, you know, time, effort, and a lot of innovation to identify the best possible blue self-emitting layer technology or material that gives us the right level of lifetime characteristics we are looking for. The second thing is that we are using a multi-stack blue self-emitting layers, which itself gives us additional buffer to kind of you know, extend the lifetime uh, for a normal consumer usage. And the third thing is that we have also developed certain proprietary IP that allows us to kind of, you know, ensure a longer lifetime of our displays. Uh, to highlight a few things, of course, it comes with some of the traditional uh, well-known uh, algorithms like, you know, stress border uh, fading, uh, logo fading, uh, stress border uh, reduction, stuff like that. But more importantly, because we use a true RGB pixel, uh, we are able to kind of create an another level of IP that allows us not only to correct in real time any kind of discrepancies uh, by monitoring the power characteristics of each subpixel, but it goes beyond it and tries to even prevent some of those um, you know, deterioration that may uh, happen in any OLED panel. So combination of all these things put together ensures that our panels can have an extended lifetime and ensure that the consumers can enjoy the excellent picture quality without having to worry too much about burn-in or any of those issues. Cool. Uh, at this time, are you able to provide image sticking data? Sure, so right now we are running tests. So like you know, we, uh, you know, for the first time showcased the technology at CES. Uh, we're working with our, you know, direct set customers and brands uh, where we have identified certain stress tests and we're running them in our labs as we speak. And in the future, we will be in a position to share that data once we have you know, uh, satisfied uh, our own uh, benchmarks in terms of the rigorousness of those tests. We're highly confident of the performance of our displays. 
Uh, we are satisfied with what we have been able to achieve uh, with the technologies that we've put in place. And what I can state with a high confidence is that we are as good or better than anything out there. Uh, but to kind of back my claim, uh, I will, you know, let, you know, share some more information uh, in the future. Sure. When you've got LT95 data uh, that you are ready to share, we would love to be able to tell the world about it. Um, that would be great. But it sounds like the, the life is going to be very good. Um, I have seen various reports on QDOLA. They came out uh, right at CES. Some of them looked like they were produced pretty quickly. And I think there's been some confusion about the subpixel structure. Can you comment on whether each of the different blue layers works on different subpixels, or if there is a single blue subpixel for each red green uh, subpixel? Uh, tell us a little bit more about the the subpixel construction, if you could. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question uh, because yes, I, I noticed that in some of the videos. Uh, so, what I would say is. Uh, the red, green, and blue pixel each has a kind of a sub-pixel that is made of the multi-stack blue OLED or the blue self-emitting layer. And that ensures, one, that each pixel has that additional buffer from a lifetime perspective. And secondly, because we are individually, uh, you know, turning on and off, not just at a pixel level, but at a sub-pixel level, the contrast modulation, the sharpness of the image, you know, also the kind of the color combinations that we can drive uh, and the color uh, volume, all of those characteristics are improved because of this uh, more advanced uh, sub-pixel structure. So it's not just one mother blue pixel and then three sub-pixels on top like a color filter, but individually we have the blue sub-pixel that then fires through some scattering material and then we have a blue subpixel for the red and a blue subpixel for the green. And each subpixel is a multi-stack layer, which ensures that you know, there is longer lifetime for each of those subpixels. So all of the blue OLED layers work on all of the different subpixel elements. Correct, correct. And that's where the IP comes into play, where uh, you know, we're able to kind of you know, in real time manage uh, the power characteristics and ensure uh, not just kind of a after the fact improvements or correction, but also in real time, how do we pre preemptively kind of correct for situations that might lead to uh, something that is uh, not what the consumer or the display uh, should uh, you know, end up at. So we kind of have that uh, proprietary IP developed uh, as a preventive measure as much as a corrective measure. So that's what kind of makes it, uh, ensures that we have a longer lifetime. So, you know, to help our viewers understand, uh, I should offer some background here about the OLED construction um, because uh, some viewers may not know this, but I was involved with Samsung Display's uh, initial efforts to make a traditional large size RGB OLED about a decade ago. And a traditional RGB OLED requires deposition of the correct colored OLED emitter into each of the appropriate subpixels using a process that's called vacuum thermal evaporation, and, and sometimes people just say VTE uh, for the abbreviation. The vacuum is required in order to achieve sublimation, where the solid OLED material is heated, and then it goes directly from the crucible uh, to a gaseous state, enabling the evaporative deposition of the material. Uh, and that's done through a fine metal mask uh, in order that the OLED material um, is only deposited on the target subpixel. However, at micron geometries, it's not easy to get uh, the proper registration of the fine metal mask uh, to the uh, target subpixel on the substrate. And furthermore, you know, the higher the resolution, that is, the lower the spacing between subpixels, the harder it gets uh, to achieve that registration. When uh, back then we realized that the market was quickly moving from full high definition to 4K resolution, it became apparent that uh, this approach would be even that much harder, that much more challenging to achieve. Uh, so, other folks developed a white OLED panel approach, and that is the current mainstream OLED TV today. Uh, and that approach solves this registration problem by taking a completely different approach. In a white OLED, an open mask is used to deposit the white OLED emitter material over the entire panel. 
by the way, I should mention, technically, you know, the white OLED is comprised of separate blue and yellow OLED emitters. Um, but what this means with an open mask is that there is no need to register the OLED material to specific subpixels. You know, instead, uh, the color gets produced by uh, subsequently using color filters to extract the individual red, green, and blue primary colors. Theoretically, color filters will eliminate two-thirds of the light, uh, and actually they'll eliminate more than that if they're not perfect, and the result of that is lower luminance. Uh, the, the countermeasure for that lost luminance is to add a white subpixel. Uh, that means that there's one of the subpixel elements out of four that has no color filter at all, and that enables uh, that kind of display to achieve peak luminance targets. Unfortunately, in turn, uh, that that approach with the white subpixel injecting white into the light stream uh, can and it does result in a loss of color saturation uh, at highlight luminance levels. So that gets us back to the QD display and Shrog back to your presentation. The QD display uses an open mask to deposit blue OLED material everywhere on the panel's substrate. Like the white OLED approach, the QD display also does not require subpixel registration for the OLED deposition. But instead of using color filters for color selection, quantum dots are used to convert that blue light to red and to green, or as Chirag, you just said, uh, there is uh, a diffuser just to let the blue through for the blue subpixels. And I emphasize here color conversion over color filtering here. Uh, the color conversion is key because with color filters, you have light losses, but with color conversion, you don't suffer those serious light losses that I just spoke about. Also, the patterning of the quantum dots is relatively straightforward. The dots can be printed onto the substrate. Uh, vacuum is not required for that step. Uh, so I think it helps uh, to give this explanation so that our viewers understand uh, what's going on with each of the traditional OLED approaches as well as white OLED and now this new QD display. Uh, Shirag, let's go back to your presentation and uh, you can tell us yeah. more. Well, first, you know, thank you for that, Brian, uh, because that was, you know, that's something that's often missed. And, you know, you, the, the, the explanation and the background you provide, uh, I'm sure for the users, but also for me, uh, was quite, uh, quite, quite helpful. So thank you. And yeah, it's, it's interesting that you have, uh, you know, I mean, I know you your background with, you know, the display industry, but you've been part of a lot of these newer technologies. You've kind of laid the foundation for many of them. So yeah, fantastic to be talking with you today about QD display. So let me go back to my presentation here. So like you correctly pointed out, uh, Brian, the combination of this innovative blue self-emitting layer and the red and green quantum dots is a very powerful platform. And that now enables some new performance horizons that I want to dive into. Uh, the first thing you will notice is the RGB spectrum, you know, the individual red, green, and blue. And we can, with QD display, get taller and slimmer RGB spectrum uh, cones compared to some of the traditional uh, technologies where the red and green are not as tall or are also very spread out. So there's a lot of... Um, adjacent color contamination. Secondly, uh, you will notice is the fact that this is a true color additivity. So the display colors are built with true color additivity. So the white is a true RGB white, as opposed to, like you mentioned, uh, some of the other traditional technologies uh, require, you know, an additional white boost to kind of, you know, match the, uh, you know, the user expectations and also the HDR standards of higher luminance in order to meet those. And the extended luminance range, I think this is a great um, you know, data point to kind of understand how these two technologies differ. And here you can see that the lumina luminance, the white luminance is made of the R plus G plus B. So no matter whether you are looking at, you know, a colorful image or a white image, you can, you know, you have the full range uh, to kind of, you know, work with when it comes to RGB and the white. While with the other traditional uh, OLED technologies, you, especially in the darker gray areas, uh, you know, you start losing some of that, as well as if you're trying to show something that is very bright, 
you have that color wash out because now you have the white pixel doing a lot of the heavy lifting in order to appear brighter. So it's almost like, you know, using the gain to kind of, you know, increase the brightness or the whiteness of the image. And that takes away some of the uh, image fidelity, uh, which we believe, uh, you know, QD display does a fantastic job thanks to the combination of the blue OLED and the RGB uh, and the red and green quantum dots put together. So what that means for the consumers and the creators is now you have the widest color gamut available. So you're expanding the canvas. Our, the QD displays TVs are capable of more than 90% of the BT 2020 coverage. And that to me is very exciting. For a long time, we had in various standards, you know, this aspiration of coming closer to the BT 2020 and, you know, somewhere down the line, uh, we kind of, you know, move towards DCI-P3, uh, which is great. Uh, but I think, you know, having this additional capabilities uh, really adds that punch to the images, uh, especially on cinema, but also if you're thinking from uh, gaming and animation, uh, you know, this is going to really elevate the experience uh, for the user here. The other aspect that I want to highlight, and I think your audience will appreciate, is the aspect of the combination of luminance with the color performance. So today, uh, the way you and I experience cinema and gaming is in HDR mode. I mean, it's all about 4K HDR. Uh, there are numerous experiments, uh, you know, as well as, you know, your own experience. It just feels so much more richer and so much more immersive when you have those specular highlights as well as those great shadow details or the deep blacks. And I think in this scenario, you know, it's important to move if you really want to compare the performance of the displays. Uh, this is, you know, more critical now than ever before to understand it from a 3D color performance. And that's what color volume is all about. It's a combination of the total range of luminance that the display is capable of, as well as its color performance. And here is where I feel that QD display really leaps forward. Uh, you know, looking at this, the gamut rings diagram itself, uh, you can see that it's significantly higher color volume. And what that allows, you know, from a experience perspective is that if you're looking at a bright, uh, colorful image, you can hold on to those bright saturated colors without having to dilute them with white or white boost. At the same time, when you are going into, you know, a deep black region, that's where, you know, oftentimes uh, what one notices with the traditional uh, self-emitting or OLED technologies is this black crush. Yes, it is quite uh, black, but, you know, you start losing the details. It just looks deep black. But because we have a true RGB pixel structure and we're able to kind of, you know, have that better contrast modulation of each subpixel uh, and each one having the tall and narrow spectral uh, cones, this combination allows for even in those deep uh, black or gray shadow regions, we're able to hold on to the details and make them visible to the user. And that to me, is extremely exciting uh, and you know because now you can have all the details uh, whether it's in the gray shadow regions but also you can have bright specular highlights uh, and bright saturated colors without the washout uh, that you often see in some of the other technologies. You're speaking to something that is a very near and dear uh, topic to my heart. Uh, you know um, CIE way back in 1976, defined color, and they defined it as being three dimensions. Here are the two dimensions of chromaticity, but there's a third dimension of luminance, and all three of those are important. And I find that for actually the past several decades, people have looked at a two-dimensional 1931 or 1976 CIE chart and said, oh, this is the color range of the display, but it is not. It is the chromatic range of the display. And the fact that at one slice of the color volume, uh, a display is capable of showing certain colors does not mean that it will be able to show that same chromaticity range as one proceeds up and down the luminance scale. So this is a very important distinction and uh, something that we clarified in 
the re recent release of the Information Display Measurement Standard version 1.1 just last July. Um, so I encourage people to read section 5.32 if they want to get deep into the tech. But thanks for making that the distinction. Let me offer some additional explanation. The images and simulations shown here are courtesy of Dr. Masaoka of NHK, who is one of the key people who defined BT2020. This image portrays the BT2020 color volume plotted in C-Lab color coordinates. In C-Lab, a fixed distance between any two points within the solid corresponds to the same amount of perceived color change. I can rotate this image to show different perspectives. Now this would be a great display, capable of 100% of BT2020. In this example, the white level is equal to the sum of the peak red, peak green, and peak blue levels. In other words, the RGB color light output equals 100% of the white light output. So what happens when the color light output is less than the peak white luminance? In this second view, I'm showing what happens when the color light output varies as a percentage of the white light output, ranging from 100% ratio as in the previous plot down to as little as 30%. When the color light output is low relative to the peak white level, it is easy to visualize the loss of reproducible colors, especially the loss of bright and saturated colors. Next, this comparison shows two displays. Both of them have the same peak white luminance. The display on the left has color light output that is 100% of the white light output. But the display on the right is dependent on added white light, such that its color light output is only 30% of the total white light output. A display with lower relative color light output has a lower color volume, and it is not as capable of reproducing as many different colors, especially bright and saturated colors, compared to the display with higher color volume. Uh, and please continue. That, that's a great point you make about, you know, chromaticity versus the color performance. And, you know, and that's a great segue into my next slide because that's, you know, uh, I did mention the color performance, but let me also, you know, what we're really excited about is the true luminance range itself as well. So now with the QD display, you know, previously, uh, you know, amongst the traditional technologies, you had to choose. Do you want a bright display or do you want the deep blacks of, you know, OLEDs? And QD display really hits the sweet spot because now we are capable with QD display to go the triple zero five deep blacks. Of course, with the additional, um, details in the lower gray and shadow regions. But also what we are uh, promising with this technology is a 10% window of you know, the peaks of a thousand nits on the TV and extreme peaks capability of 1500 nits. Uh, while with the monitor, it's a 10% peak window of 450 nits and extreme peaks of a thousand nits. And that uh, I think is very exciting because that allows you to really bring out those specular details. And what I noticed personally uh, was that there was this additional depth perception that you feel uh, when you're looking at images with different specular details, being able to really come alive without, uh, you know, this kind of halo effect. So you have the deep blacks, you have the, you know, the specular details, you have the light shining off surfaces. And it all looks very real. One of the, my favorite scene is um, there is this one video where you have the uh, Vegas, uh, you know, uh, kind of it's, it's the night scene with, you know, the bright lights of Vegas. And you can see on the QD display, the light kind of reflecting off the road, uh, almost like you're there. And, and that's what this capability brings to life. So uh, I think it's going to be very exciting for the users and creators. Uh, once they get their hands on it. I, I saw that image, you know, and so did Jeff. And, and Jeff's comment was, boy, you know, normally when you see a, a scene that has neon lights in it, it looks like a picture of neon. But when we looked at it on the, the QD display, it actually looked like neon. Right. <laughs> yeah, uh, so, yeah um, that, that was quite the favorite uh, uh, at the San Jose thing. And, I, and I yeah, we, we also saw the, the road reflections that you're talking about too. So the the deep, dark uh, level shades of gray uh, don't get uh, clipped or crushed uh, in, in uh, those scenes as well. Please keep going. Yeah, so um, the next interesting thing that QD display really brings to life uh, is the side or both, uh, is the viewing angles, horizontal as well as vertical. 
And this is because of two reasons. Uh, one is because QD display is a top emission technology. Uh, and the second thing is that the light flux of QD display is Lambertian or a dome shape. And what that enables is that the light energy is equally distributed. So no matter where you sit in the room, you see it, you know, bright, dazzling colors without luminosity loss or any color shift. And, you know, oftentimes, uh, you know, some of the other traditional technologies have also improved their viewing angles. The luminance uh, loss has been reduced, but there still is a color shift, uh, you know, especially with the WBE panels, etc. I feel that that, you know, is kind of glossed over. And um, but if you look at, you know, QD display, it's it's a real uh, it, it is kind of bringing in the next level where, you know, it's better color no matter where you sit. And also it holds the luminosity just because of the flux structure as well as, you know, being a top emission technology. Well, there's a reason for that, though. It, in, uh, in order to get higher uh, luminance at a certain uh, angle, specifically, typically on axis, uh, we use what's known as a micro cavity. Um, and that causes gain on axis, but then also you have a faster fall off. Uh, at uh, angles of incidence that are off of axis. Uh, so that's the reason for that. Um, True. Uh, so maybe that's what you're seeing. Yeah, yeah. But what you're saying is the QD display doesn't have that. It's designed to have more of a Lambertian pattern. Correct, correct. Uh, and then that's, I think, a quality of the quantum dots themselves that kind of uh, allow us to kind of get there. And the fact that it's top emission just kind of adds that additional, uh, you know, kind of delta to it to kind of make sure it's a fantastic experience for the user, irrespective of where they're sitting or standing as well. So I think the next thing is, you know, there's a lot to celebrate. You know, we focused a lot on the cinematic uh, HDR aspects, but what QD display also brings is today, you know, gaming or, or animations are just as, you know, mainstream in terms of entertainment and growing. And for that, uh, I think QD display really takes it to the next level. And there are a couple of reasons for it. Number one is its native uh, G2G response time of 0.1 millisecond. You mean gray to gray response? I mean gray to gray, correct. Uh, okay. So, you know, that really ensures no more blurs or ghosting, uh, and it's really crisp, uh, you know, no matter what kind of a fast action game you are playing. Secondly is the higher frame rate combination with this native gray to gray response time of 175 hertz on the monitors and 144 hertz on the TVs, uh, once again, you know, ensures that, you know, you can really, uh, really enjoy crystal clear motion uh, on your games and your uh, gaming devices. The combination of, you know, this response time, frame rate, better color performance, as well as the higher luminance range has ensured our monitors have qualified for the highest tier uh, VRR and HDR uh, segments, so which I think, uh, you know, for gamers that that's going to be a game, you know, a game changer if I might use that cliche, uh, because now you're getting the best of HDR luminance, so all the cinematic details without having to compromise on your core gaming performance. Uh, so it's going to be quite exciting. And the last thing that I want to mention here in terms of the QD display is that. The blue backlight has been optimized to kind of ensure a minimal exposure to the harmful blue light radiation. Uh, so that means, you know, if you're having a long binge watching session on Netflix or Amazon or Disney, or you're just having a marathon gaming session, your eyes will thank you. So it's all the gain without the strain is what I like to tell somewhat to some of my friends. Um, so yeah, that, that's QD display. Uh, and, you know, with that, you know, I am really excited to, you know, be able to share this information with you and your audience. And I really welcome you all to the quantum experience where you can hopefully see flawlessly, see differently and see everything. Well, thanks, Shirag, for this uh, detailed intro to the technology and its capabilities. Um, you know, one of the hard things about uh, doing the display show is that we have to describe displays, but it occurs to me that uh, most of the viewers watching this episode will not have seen uh, one of these displays in person. 
What I'd like to do next is to share some of my impressions based on the time that I spent with the QD OLED in December, and uh, likewise explain why it is that I'm excited about this technology. Uh, for this episode, I created a summary chart, and, and I'm going to show it now. Uh, and what it does is it compares the major flagship TV technologies. Uh, so I've included on this chart uh, quantum dot based mini LED LCDs. Uh, that's one. And then another is uh, the white OLED, which currently is just simply called OLED TV. And then the new QD display. And uh, I should also take a moment to explain this, this legend down here. Um, and uh, no, this is not from the Squid Game. Uh, this, <laughs> this double circle here means outstanding. Uh, a single circle means good. Um, I've used a triangle to point to a potential weakness. And then an X means no good. Uh, so yeah, It's really interesting. These, these symbols, when I first came to Asia, made no sense. And my first time when I saw it, and everyone knew what they're talking about, but me in the room, I was like, how do you know what is good or bad? Like, who said a circle is better than a triangle? Like, like it didn't make sense, but you know, I, I know where you're coming from, and it's great that you're explaining it to the audience, because that's so well ingrained amongst everyone that works, I guess, in Korea and Japan, um, that, you know, it's, it's second nature. But, you know, and, and once you get it, it's very easy, and it really is an aid to kind of explaining your point. So... Uh, I, I'm well, glad well, I, I first up. actually saw this in Japan, so this is going back a couple of decades. This, this has been yeah. around for a while. Hey, let me also say that the ratings here reflect my assessment, and they're not necessarily the opinions of Nanasys or, or uh, for that matter, your company, Samsung Display. So what I'd like to do is to start with peak light output. And this is important because peak luminance uh, uh, can be very significant, especially when you're viewing high dynamic range content in the presence of room illumination. Um, the QD-based mini LED LCD can achieve peak luminance levels uh, today on the market, over 2,000 nits. So it is outstanding in this category. The most recent white OLED, uh, when the set is in vivid mode with a 10% patch size, can achieve over 1,000 nits peak. Um, I measured the QD display as well, and that had an even higher white peak output level. So both of the OLED displays, I'm talking about the white OLED and the QD display, rate in this category as good. Next, I looked at contrast ratio in low light. Um, a mini LED LCD can achieve many thousands to one of contrast ratio, even without local dimming, uh, and that means uh, just based on the native LCD panel. Um, with local dimming, it can and does achieve over 10,000 to 1 contrast ratio. Now, I know some viewers are thinking about halos, and, and uh, let's get to that shortly. Uh, but by comparison, both types of OLED displays in a darkroom environment when tested with starlight contrast, uh, both the white OLED and the QD display can approach a million to 1 contrast ratio. And therefore, both of those rate is outstanding. Yeah. And Brian, I want to add a little nuance that I feel uh, is my personal opinion about, you know, this kind of contrast ratio here. One is that, yes, you know, both can achieve those triple zero five black levels. But I think what differentiates QD uh, display here is the fact that at those lower luminance levels, holding on to the color and detail fidelity is where QD outshines some of the other technologies out there. Uh, and that kind of those more detailed blacks, shadows, uh, you know, the off reflection, uh, and kind of, you know, having those specular details, if there are some, like we mentioned on the road scene, uh, really make for a much deeper, you know, kind of a much, uh, I would say, much richer experience. Uh, and I think that's what users, when they do get to see the QD display, will appreciate a lot more. Okay, that point's well noted. Um, the next thing I wanted to talk about is haloing. Uh, in an LCD with full array local dimming, even when using a mini LED backlight, haloing can appear when bright content appears next to very dark screen content. Uh, I'm demonstrating this phenomenon now in this video that I'm, I'm showing here. Uh, the less dimming zones there are, the bigger the halo that can appear around bright objects. 
this artifact can be an issue with certain types of content, especially where you have highlights right next to, to low gray or black scene. On the other hand, for both the white OLED and the QD display, there is local dimming literally at every pixel. So there is no haloing whatsoever. Uh, advantage on this point once again goes to both of the OLED displays. Next, I'll talk about something that we've already touched on, which is color volume. The mini LED quantum dot LCD can maintain very saturated colors up to the highest luminance levels. So its performance in this area is outstanding. As I explained before, the white OLED needs to rely on its white subpixel to achieve higher luminance levels. So as a result of injecting white light into the light stream, there is not as much color saturation at high luminance levels. Remember, content, as you mentioned, can be both bright and saturated. So this point is a potential weakness for the white OLED panel. However, the QD display does not need a white subpixel. Its performance for color volume is also outstanding. And this is very, very important as, as we've already discussed uh, in this episode for many types of content. As displays have aimed for DCI-P3 coverage and have even begun to express performance in terms of BT2020 range, it is important to consider color volume performance and not just market the display's chromaticity range. So for this reason, Shirag, I'm glad you discussed color volume in, in your presentation. And uh, did you want to add anything else about color volume here? Yeah, I, I think, you know, to your point, it is, you know, time for, you know, all of us in the display industry to kind of, you know, talk more about color volume, you know, understand, you know, spread, spread the right kind of information about it. Uh, and I'm glad, you know, you mentioned the IDMS, the, the updated uh, test specifications of IDMS, I think which will all help, you know, bring uh, color volume to the forefront, which I think is the need of the R, you know, especially as we move into the HDR, um, you know, world, uh, it's all about color volume. I mean, that's what we need to look at if we really truly want to compare, uh, you know, display A versus display B. Okay. Um, well, Yes, IDMS V1.1, we've talked about it in some past episodes. It does have section 5.32, which shows how to calculate color volume. And then gamut rings, which you used in your talk, uh, are presented as a 2D means of viewing 3D color volume. Uh, and that is presented in section uh, uh, 5.32.3. Finally, I'm going to talk about cost. Uh, today, uh, there are 55 inch mini LED quantum dot based LCDs on the market selling for well under $1,000. So in terms of cost, these rate as good. Um, white OLED screens are still relatively costly. Uh, and then for QD OLED, well, I guess we don't know yet. Um, I'm gonna ask you, Shirag, about that later. Uh, the, the point of this whole chart is to compare the technologies. Uh, usually any given technology has trade-offs. But I'm excited about the QD display owing to its superior front of screen performance in each of these categories. The QD OLED row does not have any known uh, triangles. Therefore, it is an exciting development for our display industry. I'm going to also say QD OLED is no longer a theoretical display. At CES in January, we saw the first product announcements uh, in the TV and monitor segments. Shrag, can you tell us a little bit more about the brands and the products that they announced? Sure. Yeah, CES was a super exciting time for everyone that has been involved with uh, the QD display journey. Um, we had uh, Sony announce their A95K, uh, top of the line uh, series for the TVs. And we had Dell announce their Alienware top of the line AW34 QD OLED. Uh, both, you know, won numerous awards by the tech and display pundits. And that was extremely, you know, uh, reinforcing in terms of, you know, what the team has been trying to deliver in terms of the performance. And to finally see it come out there and, you know, win hearts uh, really, you know, thrilled us. Uh, and so we're really excited to kind of see this in the hands of consumers uh, and see, you know, what wonderful things, uh, you know, uh, come to life once it's in the market. Well, they sound like compelling products, and I'm sure that consumers are looking forward to seeing them in showrooms soon. Uh, can you give us any details about the pricing and the availability of the models that you mentioned? Sure. So from, you know, being the component and the 
core technology provider, we're not privy to you know these more detailed uh, product launch uh, dates or the pricing. So I don't have that information. My personal expectation is that this should be sometime, you know, uh, very soon. Uh, so you know, late Q1, uh, one should start seeing some of them uh, these products in the market. That that's my expectation, but it's not something that you know I'm privy to, so I'm not familiar with. Uh, same goes for pricing. Uh, there, I have absolutely no clue uh, how these brands are planning to, you know, price it. Uh, I think this is, uh, you know, a high performance product. It really elevates the experience, uh, and I think uh, folks that value, uh, you know, the top of the line performance uh, will see a lot of value that this brings. So I think it's going to be, uh, you know, a good, successful. Uh, I, I expect a good good adoption rate uh, for this given uh, every you know all the reactions that I saw at CES uh, I think this is going to be uh, I, I don't know the price range but it's definitely going to be very com uh, compelling uh, reasons why one should get the newer uh, QD display or QD OLED products. Um, well it sounds like it was a really exciting CES for you. Uh, would you like to share any other highlights from the show? Yeah you know uh, we uh, you know for the first time I think uh, we ourselves, like QD Display from Samsung Display 1.3, uh, separate Best of Tech TR CES awards, one from uh, Digital Trends, uh, one from Engadget, uh, and the third one from HDTV Test, uh, which is a famous YouTube uh, reviewer, uh, and, you know, Vincent Toh, who does a great job of, you know, bringing some of this TV and display technologies uh, to the consumer. So it was extremely uh, exciting time for us as well because uh, you know the last thing we expected was uh, you know such a strong uh, media reaction and I think it's you know all credit goes to the technology uh, and you know what it's capable of that we've just discussed uh, so you know really excited to kind of you know let this get into more hands and you know see what those reactions are and you know hopefully this is the beginning of you know a wonderful journey ahead for QD displays, so quantum dots and OLEDs coming together. Um, so I've got to ask you kind of a bonus question, and, and sure. I don't know if you're allowed to talk about your roadmap, but is there any indication of when uh, we might be able to expect larger than 65 inch, uh, or uh, is that something where you have to invoke Samsung security and, and, and not talk about it? So I, I, I mean, I can talk from, uh, I don't have any details to share. Uh, that's still uh, not not yet out of, you know, not in a form that I can, you know, publicly share much. But I would say that, you know, those are definitely, you know, uh, feedback we have received from, you know, our interactions in San Jose as well as at CES. We're taking it very seriously. Uh, we're, you know, actively talking with our, you know, the brands and partners uh, to figure out what is the right next step. So those are, you know, things that we are, you know, discussing and working on. Uh, and, you know, we'll soon have something to share in the near future. Well, we'll, we'll stay tuned. Um, I guess uh, I just have a, a final question for you, and that's where can viewers go to learn more about the QD display? Yeah, sure. So I think one of the resources I'd point them to is innovate.samsungdisplay.com. So it's the word I-N-N-O-V-A-T-E. So innovate.samsungdisplay.com. That's, you know, a new uh, digital content hub we have launched to kind of ensure people have, uh, you know, a, a source from where they can get their news and information on QD display. Uh, they can register with their emails to kind of stay updated on, you know, some of the questions we didn't answer here, some of the details of what we discussed. So there's a host of information there. I think beyond that, you know, you know, channels like yours. So I think YouTube, uh, I'm really impressed by, you know, the coverage QD display, not just us, but also our set brands. So, you know, the Sony's and the Dell's are receiving, you know, I think they are some really good channels like the display show and a few others that do a great job of, you know, being unbiased, bringing, you know, factual, technical information, breaking it down for the consumer. So I think that would be another great source. Uh, so those two is what I would recommend as a starting point. Well, Shirag, it's been great to talk about the new QD display with you today. Thanks for being our guest. Oh, thank you, Brian, and to your team. Uh, you know, 
Uh, it's been wonderful to discuss QD display. Uh, I, uh, you know, got a lot of value from our conversations, especially your, some of your, uh, you know, past experience and anecdotes. So thank you for sharing them with us. So and look forward to, you know, reconnecting next time I'm there in the Bay Area or if you happen to come to Seoul. Sure, I'd, I'd, I'd love to see you again uh, in either place. And folks, that's all for today. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell for notification when new episodes are released.